Hi, um, I am Lorena, and I will be presenting on music therapy within hospice from an intern perspective. So the purpose behind this presentation today is um, to provide ed education on music therapy and hospice, so interventions, goals, and considerations for interns and young professionals. Uh, when I was entering my internship, I remember doing a lot of research on what hospice is and what it's like and what are some considerations for working with patients in this population. And I remember, I wish I had a comprehensive resource for interns considering hospice when I entered hospice. So this, the goal behind this is to provide a resource for other students who are considering really, you know, interning in hospice in general, uh, or just interning anywhere in general, just some considerations when getting into the field in that regard. So our agenda will be what is hospice, what is music therapy in hospice, common diagnoses and considerations, common goal areas, interventions in hospice, considerations for interns, and then I'll show you some of the research that I used to make this presentation. Okay, so before I start, just a little bit about me. Um, so I am originally from New Jersey and I moved down to Houston, Texas, which is where I'm doing my internship. The hospice that I'm interning at is down here. I am also in my first semester of the Masters of Arts in Music Therapy program at St. Mary of the Woods College while I'm doing my internship. My first degree, I went to the College of New Jersey and I graduated in 2019 with a degree in music education and a minor in psychology. And I am a violin and viola player by trade. I think definitely having to learn clinical skills on uh, guitar and piano has really pushed my musicianship to a new level. So what is hospice? So hospice is not a location like a hospital or an emergency room or a unit of, you know, a health organization. It's a service. So to qualify, a patient needs to have a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less to live, or they have to have end stage uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. And this is criteria made by the Hospice Foundation of America. So it focuses on symptom management and quality of life. So physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So the goal here, as you can tell, is it moves away from curative care and towards palliative care. So what that means is the goal is no longer to cure the patient from their condition, um, you know, because it's terminal. There is no cure for whatever it is they have. So at this point, um, the care moves towards to making sure that they're comfortable, both physically and spiritually and emotionally. So, um, you know, it definitely turns that focus to the emotional, spiritual side, addressing any concerns about the dying process. So a common, common misconception is that you have to be an older adult in order to be in hospice, and that's not true. So um, age is not a deciding factor when being put onto hospice. If you notice, I didn't say anything about age when listing the criteria. The only criteria is that there's six months or less to live, which means that a child or an adolescent, if they have a terminal illness, game can be put on hospice. Um, the difference, though, is that the rules and regulations for a pediatric or adolescent hospice, as well as coverage, looks different than adults. Okay, so we're going to watch this video from Vitas Hospice, um, or Vitas Healthcare. This was created back in 2016. And I want you to be thinking about these two questions. A, what were some things you heard or noticed in that video, especially watching the music therapist interact with patients? And then two... Based on what you saw, what might be some interventions that you might see in hospice? So be thinking about those as you're watching. Everything I do from the moment that I walk in is for a purpose. There's a reason. And when a patient isn't feeling well, that's the moment that we want to be there. That's the moment where we can provide the most and be the most effective. And I'm constantly assessing as the session goes on how I can change, how I can use the music to help this need. Are you going to sing with me? My name is Erica Santiago, and I'm a music therapist with Vitas Hospice. You know, 
when I first heard of hospice, I thought patients that can't communicate, they're literally on their deathbed. Yes, I have patients that are actively dying, but most of my patients can talk to me. They laugh, they make jokes, you know, they're actively engaged in their every day. It's just that they have this terminal illness that, you know, they can't do anything about. What's difficult in wanting to accept hospice? They don't know what it's gonna be like. They don't want someone coming in and poking and prodding. How are you doing? How are you feeling? You know, how are you coping with this? It's, it's overwhelming. With music therapy, it's non-intrusive. I can get the same answers without asking those questions. Okay, so I encourage you to really reflect and think about what were some things you heard or noticed in that video, especially watching the music therapist interact with patients. And then also, based on what you saw, what might be some interventions that you might see in hospice? So be thinking about those and how that relates to your professional work. Okay, so what is music therapy in hospice? So music therapy in hospice seeks to address any social, emotional, spiritual concerns that a patient might have in end of life, such as meaning attribution, turning the situation into a meaningful experience for the family, and working on what we call legacy projects. So legacy projects create something with the patient um, with the purpose of sharing that with their family after and also providing meaning for their life, whether that be writing a song about their life, or doing a heartbeat song, which we'll talk about later, um, or any sort of project that can be, you know, aiding them and leading a legacy about their life. Um, at times, it can be used to address um, physical concerns, such as difficulty breathing, you know, pain management. You know, it also can be incorporated, incorporating the ISO principle or uh, entrainment. Music therapists can also provide inter interventions like uh, song validated life review, where they um, invite the patient to speak about their life and they pull out music to uh, validate some of the memories that they were sharing. Please bear in mind that that does require a very intimate and extensive knowledge of repertoire of a variety of different genres because you're putting the patient's preferred music at the forefront. Um, you know, uh, you can do lyric analysis, songwriting, instrument play, et cetera. So music therapy can also include family in the session to provide closure for them. So family can be included in the life review and songwriting interventions, meaning that they can hold the patient's hand, pat their shoulders, uh, provide additional sensory stimulation, uh, which we would call that therapeutic touch. You know, um, they can share memories of their loved one and, you know, that will give the loved one's brain um, stimuli, familiar stimuli to latch onto. Um, it's also important to talk about what music therapy in hospice is not, right? Um, so music therapy in hospice is not another clinician playing music for the patient in their session with the patient. It is not the family playing recorded music in the home. And it is not entertainment in an assisted living facility. It's not that those things aren't important or aren't valuable. Um, they can be very valuable and very important, but it's not music therapy. Uh, music therapy is a evidence-based professional field that people go to school to study. And there's a lot of considerations, a lot of research that go into music therapy specifically. So playing recorded music, while it's still valuable, if it's not done or used in a therapeutic way by someone who's trained to do so, it's not music therapy. Okay, so common goal areas in hospice. So reminiscence is one of them. So using themes from the lyrics and music to help the patient think back on their life. So this would be a good goal for lyric analysis or songwriting interventions um, to assist the patient in looking back on themes and memories of their life. So um, I've used this with patients to find meaning in storytelling and, um, you know, to find the meaning of their life, you know, and um, 
how they've chosen to exist in this world. Song validated life review is another one. So where a patient tells you about their life and the music therapist asks them questions to uh, help them expand on that. Uh, then they will pull out um, songs and play songs from the patient's preferred music to validate uh, whatever the music there or whatever the patient is sharing. Like I said, having a wide variety of repertoire available to you by memorization first and foremost, but then also if you have like a catalog or a, a tab sheet book or anything is really important because um, you want to be able to have access to them either through memory or written means um, as soon as you need it. Pain management is another goal. So this would be a great opportunity for the use of the ISO principle um, to help aid in shortness of breath due to pain. Music can also be utilized as a distraction um, per se from the pain and uh, subsequent agitation. Agitation and um, anxiety are part of the disease process for a lot of people. So music can be used as um, a means to assist in that. It also can be used to connect the family and patient. I will say it is important right here to note that this can be a family of choice or a biological family. This can also be a friend or a power of attorney. Um, it's whatever the patient identifies as their family. It doesn't necessarily have to be a biological family. Um, including the family in the session can include inviting them to share about the patient. Um, it can have them share memories, um, therapeutic touch like we talked about. If the patient is nonverbal, um, have the family share about the patient and their life. Lastly, um, you know, it can be used to aid someone in passing peacefully and in experiencing death peacefully. Um, so music can be used to provide comfort while a patient is passing as well as to their families. Robert E. Kraut wrote an article, a journal article in 2003 titled Music Therapy with Imminently Dying Hospice Patients and Their Families, Facilitating Release Near the Time of Death. He wrote this again in 20, uh, 2003, and he wrote, music therapy is a service modality that can help to facilitate such communication between the family and the patient who is actively dying while also providing a comforting presence. So as far as interventions go in hospice, we already talked about song validated life review. Um, I would like to move down to songwriting. So the music therapist and the patient or family write a song together. There's two types of songwriting. There's piggyback songwriting, and then there's original songwriting. Original songwriting is where you and then the patient and family generate a completely original song with original music, original melodies, et cetera. Piggyback songwriting is where you take a song that already exists, and then you have the patient and family substitute their own lyrics, but using the same melody and music as the original song. Um, this can be done using a worksheet of lyrics to an existing song with words or phrases omitted for the patient to fill in, or it can be completely new lyrics. The only consideration, further consideration I would put here is that this really depends on the patient's um, cognitive abilities and their diagnosis. So someone who has mid- to advanced dementia, dementia or Alzheimer's might not be successful at songwriting just due to the cognitive delays and as well as struggles to generate their own lyrics. So um, especially if it's a song that is already familiar to them, their brain might continue to latch on to the already existing lyrics and they might not be able to generate original lyrics. So that's just something to consider the patient's diagnosis when doing this particular intervention. So for the heartbeat song, um, the music therapist will audio record either the patient singing a song or the music therapist singing a song of the patient's choice and will also record the patient's heartbeat. Using an audio mixing software, the music therapist would fuse the heartbeat and the song into one recording. And we're going to see an example of that right here. All right. So I'm just going to put this as your stethoscope here. Okay. You want to feel it? I'm just going to put it under your shirt. Just real like that. There's your heart.
Everybody is used to having photographs. We're used to um, these images we have of each other that are kind of, um, they're really the external parts of us. And when you know someone deeply, you can look at a photograph and think of the internal part of that person. But still, we know when we move in close to our loved ones that that's just the container. Oh, my love will fly to you. Each night on angels wings. So that's just an example of a heartbeat song. So lastly, cognitive stimulation is another intervention. So this would be appropriate for people who are at um, towards the end of their diagnosis and the end of their life, um, and they might have a hard time speaking or moving or um, opening their eyes, um, and they're not really able to engage actively in music therapy, but they can engage passively. So you would go in and you would place some of their preferred music to give their brain some stimulation that they can latch onto. Okay, so from some considerations for music therapy interns, rather. So the first being, um, consider the, pa the patient's age and cultural background. What is their ethnicity? How old are they? Where did they grow up? What language or languages do they speak? Uh, these are all really important considerations to make um, when selecting music for the patient. Try to ask the patient directly um, what music they enjoy. If they are unable to answer, speak with their family or their loved ones, and they can give you some information on that. If you're still not able to identify information regarding the patient's preferred music from the patient themselves or from the family, a good rule of thumb, you know, this is more so if they're an older adult, um, figure out what music they enjoyed when they were in their 20s and 30s, um, or what music was popular in the 20s and 30s, rather, and then go off of there. Also, uh, consider the patient's diagnosis. Patient symptomology may make it easier or harder for a patient to engage with the intervention. So this will impact how they engage with the music, and thus informing intervention. For example, with congestive heart failure, there's typically a buildup of blood um, around the heart, which then puts pressure on the lungs. Due to this, it might not be best to have the patient singing a slow and elongated song because of the struggle to breathe. Um, additionally, like I said before, patients with dementia or Alzheimer's might struggle with songwriting depending on where they are at in their diagnosis. Um, consider the patient's family, guardians, or power of attorney, right? If the family is present for a session, uh, how can you engage them to make it a meaningful experience? What questions can you ask or interventions can you plan to include them in the experience and help foster a core memory for the family? This could look like encouraging them to give physical touch, uh, you know, between the patient and family. Um, it could look like encouraging them to play like an instrument with the group um, during collective music making. Um, it can also look like um, asking them to share memories um, or facts about the patient's life. Um, if the family is not present for a session, how can you communicate with them that will um, make them feel like they are part of the patient's care? Are you calling them somewhat regularly and updating them on their loved one? Um, are you creating legacy projects for the family after? Lastly, this is, I think is very important. Um, consider this. If you were the patient, how would you feel experiencing the session as it is, as you're running it right now. Thinking about how you're speaking to and about the patient, regardless of their level of support needs. They can hear you, right? Speak to and about the patient with dignity and respect, which they deserve. Use language that you would use to speak with a colleague, friend, family member. Um, you know, especially if the patient is nonverbal and they're in the room with you and the physicians and doctors and with the family, Assume that the patient is able to hear and understand everything you're saying, right? So speak to the patient, even if they're not going to respond. Speak about them with the assumption that they can hear you, right? Um, for example, there's been um, scenarios where I will be talking to a patient or talking to a loved one about the patient, rather, um, and I'll say something like, the patient was, and then insert whatever attribute the family shared with me. 
the was is not appropriate because the patient is still here and still with us, right? So be very mindful of the language that you're using when speaking to and about the patient. Okay, other considerations for interns. Okay, so first off, consider the level of pain that the patient is in and their degree to which they're able to communicate needs and also their diagnosis or com comorbidities. As discussed, consider the diagnosis and any level of pain that they're in. If they're in pain, they're not gonna be able to participate in any socio-emotional interventions because of the pain. Also consider possible triggers, family dynamics, culture or faith or lack thereof, um, relationship to music and lyrical content. Uh, this is to reduce harm as much as possible and make sure that you are meeting the patient exactly where they are and addressing what they need in that moment. Lastly, utilize your interdisciplinary team. They might have um, information on the patient that you don't um, just because of their scope of practice. If you have a patient, for example, who is spiritual but not religious, um, and if you're having a hard time figuring out how to navigate that, that would be a good conversation to have with the chaplain if your hospice company employs one. Or if you're not really sure what their family dynamic is like, that would be a good conversation to have with the social worker, who is the one that typically oversees the funeral home arrangements, um, any counseling needs with the family, do not resuscitate forms, engaging with the assisted living facility if there is one, et cetera. Consider your assessment, right? In your assessment, music therapists and interns need to assess these aspects. The presence of physical symptoms, cognitive and communication ability, psychosocial needs and concerns, spiritual preferences, musical preferences and backgrounds. So to what degree did they engage in music? Were they a musician or not, et cetera. Also individual family history, trauma history, triggers, et cetera. And lastly, so, uh, lastly but similarly, consider um, what you're using to create your treatment plan and your goals and objectives. So think about the therapeutic needs of the patient and family based on the things you assessed in your assessment. Consider the patient's age and developmental level, right? The needs and goals and objectives for someone who is 15 on hospice is gonna be different than someone who is 95 on hospice. Consider their family members and how old they are and what their developmental levels are. If it's a 65-year-old patient who um, is a dad and has kids that are minors that are in the home, um, that's going to be a wildly different set of hospice needs than someone maybe who is 100 years old living in a assisted living facility. Consider the physical and cognitive abilities of the patient, including sensory processing issues or needs. And all, lastly, again, consider any trauma history. That brings us to the end of our presentation. So here's the research that I compiled when creating this presentation. Um, I would also encourage um, anyone listening to um, engage with Russell Hilliard's research. He is a, a pioneer in music therapy and hospice. He had a hand in almost all, if not all, the existing research about uh, music therapy and hospice um, and definitely recommend his research for sure.